the Electronic and Photonic Materials Division. So without further ado, I will hand the, the floor over to Jim, and he's going to tell us about the growth and characterization and applications of monoisotopic hexagonal boron nitride, which has been a really exciting development in the field for a variety of reasons. So thanks, Jim. Well, thank you, Joan. It's, it's been a real pleasure to come here and, and be with people of kindred spirit. Uh, I've followed Joan's work for a long time, and and, and I'm very impressed with the facilities and the people I've met here, so it's, it's great to be here. So I'm going to talk about um, solution growth of, of boron nitride. And the um, uh, first thing I guess I should point out is, is so this is, is one of the, the, the crystals we've grown on, on a metal, and then we exfoliate it, and, it, and it's pretty good size for a freestanding piece of boron nitride, maybe a 10 to 20 microns thick, and and a couple centimeters across. So, um, so the question might come up is why would you be interested in, in uh, varying the isotope concentration? Um, so I have this quote that practically all physical properties are dependent to some degree on their isotope concentration, in, including lattice constants, elastic constants, and especially the, uh, things that involve um, the motion of, of phonons, so thermal conductivity, is, is uh, something that really varies. If you look over on the uh, top left for uh, silicon, an example from silicon, silicon, uh, natural silicon has three isotopes, but if you uh, eliminate uh, two of the isotopes, if you only have one silicon isotope, then the thermal conductivity at low temperature will increase by order of magnitude. And, and kind of what you would expect that um, uh, as you mix the isotopes, the, the maximum mixing at 50-50%, you, you see that the, the thermal conductivity kind of goes to a minimum. Um, and so and, and this um, effect on, on thermal conductivity is due to isotopic disorder that you think about uh, different masses will vibrate at different speeds. And so um, if you have two different two masses and they're each vibrating at different speeds, they'll, they'll tend to scatter uh, phonons more. Um, so if you can eliminate that, you can you can increase the thermal conductivity and, and uh, change some of the other properties as well. So there's other a couple other properties that are, are vary with uh, isotope concentration also. Um, so for boron in particular, so I, I guess I'm cheating a little bit. Uh, I, I, when I say we're using a single boron isotope, really, really it's just the boron that we have one isotope. Uh, the nitrogen, I don't worry about. The nitrogen's mostly uh, nitrogen 14. There is a little bit of nitrogen 15 in, in uh, natural nitrogen. But um, a couple key properties of, of boron. So it has two main isotopes two stable isotopes, uh, boron-10 that's that's 20% and boron-11, which is 80%. And, and the, the most notable thing about uh, boron-10 is that it, it, it has strong interactions with neutrons. So um, you see the thermal neutron capture cross-section is almost 4,000. And that compares with most elements have a, a cross-section of about one, one barn or less. Um, so boron will react with a neutron Boron-10 will react with a neutron and, and um, uh, a nuclear reaction to form lithium and uh, alpha particles, whereas uh, boron-11 is pretty much uh, transparent to neutrons. And, and nitrogen has just a little bit of, of uh, uh, neutron activity. So, so key things to notice is, is boron comes in two isotopes. And uh, so when I talk about monoisotope topic, I mean, uh, either one boron isotope or the other, boron 10 or 11. So again, just to emphasize that uh, one, there's several reasons to, to be interested in just uh, use one isotope or, or another. You can certainly increase the thermal conductivity. Um, predictions here, you see that uh, on the right hand side for, so is there a laser pointer by chance? If not, well, okay, so. Um, so a natural boron nitride has a thermal conductivity shown here and uh, predicted for both monoisotopic, you can see that, that the thermal conductivity increases from maybe about 400, predicted to increase from about 400 to 550. 
And if you go to single layers, then you can get even uh, greater enhancements of, of thermal conductivity. So certainly changing the, the thermal conductivity is one, one aspect. Um, changing the uh, phonon lifetimes is another. Um, I'll talk more about that. They have different nuclear spins, so that could potentially be something of interest. And, and as I've discussed before, uh, to increase or decrease neutron absorption is, is a possibility. So um, just to remind you what hexagonal boron nitride is, this is the, the graphitic like structure and uh, it consists of, of planes of boron and nitrogen bonded with strong bonds here uh, in the plane and weak bonds between uh, the planes and, and this, uh, this great figure. I like this figure. This is my she just went to get you a laser pointer. That's what she just did. Shout out to her. This is a great figure. I like that figure. So alternate between boron and nitrogen there in, in stacking. It has sort of an A, A prime stacking. It's a planar lattice, hexagonal lattice, with atoms alternating between boron and nitrogen. And, and uh, that's, that's more or less what it looks like. So boron, hexagonal boron nitride's been around for 60 or 70 years. Um, so uh, has many properties that are advantageous, low density, uh, very high thermal st stability, very, uh, um, it doesn't oxidize to 800 degrees Celsius or more. It's chemically inert, no acids or bases will attack it at room temperature. It's, it's non-wetting and highly lubricious, so it's used in um, makeup, uh, cosmetics. It, it, it has a nice slick feel to it. It's a whitener, so they'll use it in cosmetics. I like the Ben Gobain name, Trebian, so <laughs> play on the French words there. And uh, high in-plane thermal conductivity, so it's added to polymers to increase uh, thermal conductivity and it has a high uh, electrical resistivity. So it's so it's, it's been used to, uh, for a long time. Uh, there's essentially uh, three commercial forms. There's powders, uh, typical powder size of, of maybe one to 50 microns across, looks something like this. And uh, these tend to be low purity because they have lots of native oxides on the surface. Um, you can take the powders and press them into ceramics and center them. And uh, this is the hot pressed boron nitride form. It's a very soft material, so easy to machine. And then there's the pyrolytic boron nitride shown uh, on the right, often used for uh, crucibles in, in uh, MBE systems. And, and, and in PBN, uh, this has very anisotropic properties, but it has a high purity and the crystal plane. Um, so typically the, the C axis uh, perpendicular to this hexagonal plane points uh, up away from the surface, but in the plane, you have this rotation taking place. So it's not aligned in the, in the plane um, and, and typically has a very fine uh, crystal structure to make the, the PBN. So these are, these are the common uh, commercial forms of, of boron nitride. But uh, people are now interested in the last 10 or 15 years um, in uh, potential new applications of hexagonal boron nitride. Yeah. For example, it's ultra uh, wide indirect band gap and, and strong UV luminescence emission. So there's a study uh, by Chu et al. That, uh, comparing the luminescence of thank you. comparing the luminescence of, um, of of hexagonal boron nitride to diamond. So you can see it's orders of magnitude higher uh, uh, with um, in comparison to, to diamond. So, it's, so even though it does have an indirect band gap, it, 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 it's uh, very efficient in, in luminescence. The difficulty, of course, is, is uh, doing this, stimulating it electrically. Uh, it's a hyperbolic material. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but basically, the, the real part of the permittivity goes uh, positive and negative, goes negative down here. And, and so that has some um, interesting applications. Single photon emission. Um, so it'll emit single photons at a time. And of course, um, single and bilayers of, of boron nitride are the ultimate thin membranes. Um, I guess I have that on the next slide. Um, so membranes, uh, people are using this for uh, separations, boron nitride. Um, 
it turns out that um, hydrogen and deuterium can diffuse through these uh, um, thin layers at, with high efficient high separation factors, and so it's a good good for separating hydrogen isotopes and uh, uh, at, at relatively low energy in comparison to something like distillation, which takes a lot of energy to separate. Um, other applications, uh, certainly substrates and dielectrics for graphene and other devices is shown here. Um, deep UV emitters, there, that's one goal. Nanophotonics, nanophotonics is the concept of uh, squeezing light down to dimensions much smaller than the wavelength uh, uh, in free space. And there's been some success there. You know, interference, interference-less polarization splitting, the idea that the, uh, in, in normal isotropic media that uh, light of two polarizations is both reflected and, and transmitted, but there's some work where people are working on uh, one of the, the polarizations is transmitted and the other one is reflected. So interesting application there. Membranes for separations and neutron detectors uh, I've mentioned. So all these applications require high quality uh, hexagonal boron nitride single crystals. So, um, and so how do we measure quality? Uh, I like this uh, slide also from uh, Shu. Basically, uh, the common ways are to look at uh, Raman spectroscopy, cathodal luminescence, and and the radiative uh, efficiency. And they compared four different sources, but but basically for the highest quality boron nitride, you should have a Raman peak width of uh, eight eight wave numbers or less. Um, in cathode luminescence, what you're looking for is you want intense high intensity above about uh, 5.5 eV and low intensity uh, below that, uh, and then high overall uh, intense radiate radiate radiative. <laughs> efficiency. So, so I see a lot of papers where uh, people look at composition of, of the films they've, they've grown, and, and certainly composition is, is important, um, but uh, crystal quality is also essential. And, and this is one of my, my career favorite plots of, of shows the efficiency of light emitting diodes as a function of edge pit density. Edge pit density is, is associated with defects in the material. And what you see is that uh, defects um, really kill the device efficiency. So for uh, example, on gallium aluminum arsenide, that, that if you get defect densities above about 10 to the six per square centimeter, then your, your device uh, is pretty much dead. So, and people are starting to recognize this for 2D materials as well in, in Jim Hone's group in, uh, at, from Columbia. They've, they've recently come out with a paper looking at, at um, at tungsten diselenide and compared uh, material grown by two techniques, the chemical vapor transport and also flux method. And in the flux method, uh, defect density is 100 times less. And consequently, the, the photoluminescence is, is much more intense from, from the, the better quality material. So, uh, you know, um, defects matter and, and decreasing the defect um, is, is essential. So how, how is uh, the best quality boron nitride uh, produced in the world? Um, and actually it almost all comes from, from Japan and these two researchers, Watanabe and Taniguchi. Um, and there's a wonderful article that came out in Nature this, this year, uh, a few months ago, that talked about their, their career. So they've, they've shared uh, boron nitride with over 300 different groups um, and uh, as of now, they, they've published 431 papers where they've provided the boron nitride to all those groups. And those papers have been cited uh, 30,000 times. And you can see how their publication records really going up and up. Um, so just phenomenal researchers. But essentially, they, they, they produced uh, all the high quality um, boron nitride in, in most of the, the studies that have been done worldwide. Uh, you know, over the summer they had three papers in science in the same issue, uh, just really impressive. And, and you can kind of see the high, high, uh, high pressure um, system they use here. He's loading it up um, and they use a very high pressure process. And it looks something like this schematically. 
they take a, a boron nitride and add a solvent, and then they weld it inside a molybdenum crucible. So here you can see after growth and a cross section after uh, they split it open. And then an example of, of the uh, molybdenum crucible. And in this case, they, they ran it at conditions to actually produce the diamond-like form of, of boron nitride. But um, so, so their process, they, they seal the um, boron nitride source and the solvent, which is a barium boron nitride, into this uh, uh, molybdenum crucible. And then they, they'll uh, put pressure of 55,000 atmospheres on it and heat it up to this temperature. And they, uh, they grow the best quality material, um, without a doubt. And, and, and they, they share, have shared it with lots of people. But um, what I contend is that this isn't real. Yeah. What's the size of the sample that they It's a millimeter. Okay, so it's a centimeter square. Yeah, so, so the crucible is, is probably, you know, a couple centimeters across. Um, well, I guess here we have yeah, scale. scale there. Okay. So, and, and that's, that's the challenge when you're operating at such huge pressures, it's, it's difficult to scale this up, this process up to very big. And, um, you know, it's also a, a difficult process for uh, academics to, to duplicate because of the, the cost of the pressure. But uh, I contend, and, and actually what those researchers also showed was that you don't need such high pressures to grow high quality crystals. So if we look at the phase diagram of, of boron nitride, first thing to note is where the liquid uh, appears. So it's above 3000 Kelvin. So you're never gonna melt uh, boron nitride, or I shouldn't say never, somebody's gonna be clever about that, but it, it would be very difficult to grow from the melt. So, so that's why we use a solution. It's like dissolving sugar into water. Uh, it, it's a solution. You're not melting the sugar, you're dissolving it into water. So and the next thing to note is um, the wide range of where hexagonal boron nitride is stable. And even though the, the diamond form of, of boron nitride is, is actually stable. A uh, pr better prediction made this summer that, that uh, at room temperature, cubic boron nitride is a stable form. But uh, really, for kinetics to happen, for any sort of diffusion or reactions, you need to be operating probably above 1,000 uh, Kelvin. And so uh, um, for this, and also if you look at the vapor pressure of nitrogen, the partial pressure of uh, nitrogen over hexagonal boron nitride, it's really quite low. So at, at the temperatures we use, it's, it's like 10 millionths of an atmosphere. So very low pressures are required for the boron nitride to be stable. So you really don't need the extraordinary high pressures uh, to grow uh, high quality hexagonal boron nitride. So the process we use is actually quite simple. Uh, we have uh, a, a single zone temperature furnace with source materials here, um, heated up to uh, 1550. This is all at atmospheric pressure. We uh, feed hydrogen and nitrogen, uh, mostly nitrogen, over our source materials. Source materials, we can either use pure hexagonal boron nitride, so already compounded, or we can use separate sources. Um, and uh, Boron is, is sold, commercially sold, isotopically pure, either boron 10 or boron 11, which is how we get the um, monoisotopic. So uh, the solvents we use are nickel plus chromium and a temperature of uh, 1550 Celsius. And it's an open system. We have uh, nitrogen going through here and vacuum pumps to, to get rid of the oxygen before we start. So if you look at the phase diagram for um, uh, this, the, uh, we use boron because it's a good solvent for, I'm uh, sorry, we use nickel because it's a good solvent for boron. So you, it has a eutectic of around 1100 uh, uh, degrees Celsius. So, so that's good. You can get a, a liquid at relatively low temperatures. Um, now, uh, nickel is a terrible solvent for, for nitrogen. So what we do is mix it with chromium and chromium actually enhances nitrogen solubility. So it's, it's kind of shown in the yellow here that just a, a, even a few percent of, of chromium will, will greatly enhance uh, the solubility of nitrogen. But there's, uh, an, this is actually, it, I can describe it sort of simple, but it's actually a lot of things going on. There's chemical reactions going on. Uh, the, the boron reacts with the nitrogen to form boron uh, nitride. The chromium reacts with nitrogen to form chromium um, nitride as well. Um, and then uh, you have phase equilibria, you have 
uh, gas phase, nitrogen, uh, and a liquid mixture of uh, nickel, chromium, and, and boron. So, uh, so that's kind of the setup. And so first thing we, we encounter is what to use uh, as a, um, a crucible material. So first we started out with a uh, hot press boron nitride crucible. And the idea being in, in that case, the, the flux wouldn't touch anything but um, the, the same sort of material. And, and, and so uh, we're thinking that no, no contamination by, by contacting it with other materials. Um, but uh, a couple of, uh, one drawback to this is the solution's always saturated with, in contact with the boron nitride. So we've also tried and alumina crucibles work just as well. In this case, then we can use uh, pure boron as a source. Um, and, and then uh, we can also do things like play with how we distribute the boron to get, uh, and, and we can use that advantageously to grow larger crystals. And then we can also produce uh, crystals that are, are not are solutions that aren't fully saturated. So, so, so we can actually go above the saturation condition and then cool. So uh, this is typically what, what comes out of um, our process. So um, we have our, our solidified boule and then the, the boron nitride uh, precipitates on the, on, the, on the surface of the, the, the melt as it freezes. And, and so as individual crystals, then a couple different morphologies, either we can have individual crystals that are separated like this, or we can have sort of a continuous film like this. And, and uh, depending on the conditions we grow, and, and then we can peel those off to have uh, pretty big freestanding flakes. And typically these are tens of millimeters in area and, and uh, uh, 10 to 20 microns uh, thick. Um, so I mentioned we had hydrogen. Um, so uh, in one of the earlier uh, crystal growth, this was kind of the result, very fine grain produced uh, structure, very relatively thick structure, but adding the hydrogen, I think reduces the native oxide on, on, on the, the powders we use, the nickel, the chromium, the, the boron, uh, and it helps remove that. And it also may have some etching effects to, to reduce the nucleation density. But then uh, by adding the hydrogen, we can get much more transparent uh, crystals that uh, um, look pretty good, I guess. So have uh, good transparency. We have kind of a, uh, this is an optical uh, micrograph. We have good transparency. There's kind of a, a fish scale uh, texture to this where, where one crystal will be growing over another crystal like this. So kind of like fish scale, you can kind of see that here in the, in the optical micrograph, but also under the SEM, you can see that the, the grains kind of grow over one another. So lots of steps in, in the, the crystal. Um, and, and some lines that are probably associated with defects. So uh, this is just an illustration of, of how the HBN uh, produce looks uh, different at, by, at different met methods. Uh, this is the pyrolytic, the commercial form pyrolytic boron nitride uh, with the C axis aligned uh, perpendicular to the surface. Uh, this is a, a film taken, peeled off a, a sapphire substrate. And this is one of our crystals that you can see the, the transparency these pretty good. So these, these, these two are about similar thicknesses. So you can see the difference there. So I mentioned the quality is, is uh, determined by Raman spectra. So uh, for, for natural boron nitride, we're getting crystals with uh, Raman peaks uh, less than uh, uh, eight wave numbers. And it, uh, peak position is also uh, something not shifted from, from a relaxed position for, for Boron nitride. Typically, this, the deposited films have uh, peak position somewhere else, a little bit higher, um, indicating there's some some uh, strain present. The photoluminescence looks pretty good too. Um, so, uh, first of all, we have peaks uh, at high en energy above uh, 5.5 eV, um, and and so and we have low uh, low peak intensity below between below 5 eV. And so, um, so, and then the relative ratio of uh, the peak to these two peaks also indicates the, the crystals are, are pretty good high quality. 
So they're actually comparable to what uh, Wantanabe and uh, Taniguchi uh, grow, um, at least in, in terms of ramen and, and photoluminescence. So uh, my collaborators at the University of Bristol have done more characterization. Um, and and uh, here you can see examples of uh, Raman peaks as a function of uh, isotope concentration. And, and a couple things to note. Uh, so the boron 11 is shifted to a lower peak position, like uh, 1352. And then the boron 10 is at a higher position, 1392. But also notice that they're much narrower than the uh, natural boron nitride, which I guess is the which one the the, the red curve there. So um, so the peak widths for for uh, monoisotopic is about uh, three wave numbers, so so less than half of what it is for the natural. Um, they did some X-ray diffraction, uh, not X-ray uh, electron beam diffraction, and uh, at least perpendicular to the surface, it, it, it uh, looks pretty good. Uh, you look at it under SEM, as shown before, you can certainly see steps. And they also did electron uh, backscattering uh, diffraction. And the C-axis, again, is, is pretty good pointing up, all pretty much aligned. But within uh, the material, there's uh, grains, um, some rotation of the grains. Uh, between boundaries. They also observe some, some screw dislocations and some partial dislocations and of course grain boundaries. But, but there are, are pretty good sized regions with uh, uh, high quality and, and uh, relatively low uh, defect densities. So we've actually done uh, defect sensitive etching. I showed the, the plot for, for the traditional 3.5 uh, semiconductors earlier. Um, uh, so we've developed defect sensitive etching as a way to, to quantify the defects present in the material, etching the crystals at about 450 Celsius for a minute or two in a mixture of molten uh, potassium hydroxide, uh, so sodium hydroxide. And uh, we wind up with uh, hexagonal pits on the surface, something like that. What are the defects that-, that I'm gonna tell you. Um, so, and you look at the surface and you can count them up and, and um, uh, get a, n a number of about uh, 10 to the 7th, 10 to the 8th uh, per square centimeter for edge bit densities. So we've, we've Question, yeah. What is the number for the edge pin grown by the Japanese growers? Um, I think it might be lower, but I'm not sure. I don't, I don't remember. And I don't, I'm not sure if they've reported it. Um, I can't remember. Sorry. Yeah, no, one good pop-up we're asking. Uh, how is this process different from using ammonia boring as the source material? Question. Um, so that's a uh, ammonia. So the question, do I need to repeat that? Yeah, or they heard actually, it. So uh, how, how, how is this different than the ammonia boring process? So this, this is not a, a deposition process. This is a solution growth process. So we don't have a substrate. The, the, the boron nitride is not constrained to a substrate. So, um, so it's more of a precipitation out of a liquid. So uh, in that regard, uh, I think that's one of the reasons uh, it comes out strain free and, and maybe better quality. So to answer your question about what are, what are, what's responsible for the edge pits, um, so we have done some cross-sectional TEM. Um, uh, collaborators have done that and uh, they did the diffraction analysis and, and we're able to, to see that where the etch pits were, it doesn't show up very good, but they were able to, to follow that, that these are edge type dislocations, threading dislocations that run through the material. So um, we had um, some uh, XPS done on the binding energies for the different uh, isotope concentrations, and we do see a very slight shift in the, the peak positions, uh, XPS peak positions that suggest that, um, that well, the, definitely the uh, H11 boron nitride appears at a slightly higher energy than the H10BN, and then the natural with the mixture of the two is located between them. So, so are, what about point defects rather than line defects? Will they not? show up because they won't make pits. Right. 
So uh, yeah, uh, uh, we need to figure out how to find point defects. Yep, that's certainly certainly something that needs to be done. Uh, so I showed uh, some some uh, tungsten diselenide where you could actually count the the, the defects with uh, STM, but this is such an insulating material. I don't think STM would work. So, but I, I think that's a very good thing to address is, is the point defects in the material. If you got some ideas, I, I'd like to hear them. So we've actually uh, uh, measured the thermal conductivity of the material uh, on three different types or four different types. Uh, the, the, the 10, the 11, uh, the natural mixture and a 50-50 mixture. So you can see that uh, the thermal conductivity for the monoisotopic is, is uh, uh, three times higher at the low temperature than the, than the natural. Natural is down here. And if you have a greater mixture of boron isotopes, 50-50 mixture, the, the thermal conductivity is even lower. So this is the in-plane thermal conductivity shown here. And then the out-of-plane is shown over here. But you can see that uh, at, at room temperature, it's maybe 40% higher. So we get numbers of, uh, for the B10 of uh, around 600 uh, watts per meter Kelvin. And then for the natural, around 400. So, um, and then you can really see what an anisotropic material this is. So the thermal conductivity uh, at room temperature is around 600. Uh, in the plane and only maybe six or something uh, perpendicular to the plane. Um, so uh, I guess, oh, so also looked at low temperature photoluminescence with the uh, different isotope concentrations, both the, the 10, the natural and the B11. And we see a little bit of a shift in the peak positions with uh, uh, boron isotope and, and uh, my collaborators have, have seen that shown that there's a, a blue shift in the B11 of about 1.6 milli EV and, and red shift and downshift in the B10. So, so there's definitely a, a difference in, in the energy band gaps. So uh, extrapolating to 0.2, the indirect band gap shift is about 225 MeV. So. Interesting, the uh, same collaborators from France also did uh, electron density distributions from an X-ray diffraction study. And this is looking in plane of, uh, between boron and nitrogen. So uh, they, they observed uh, a, a slight uh, minimum in the uh, electron density, slightly shifted toward nitrogen in the B10. So you can compare the B10 and the B11. Uh, so the outer plane electron density is more spread out around the nuclei in the B10. So more spread out in this case than it is in the B11. So uh, again, slight differences in, in the electron uh, density distribution as well. So there, there are definite uh, differences between um, the two different uh, isotopes of boron. So uh, um, I think one of the more interesting applications of, of boron, uh, boron nitride is, is for uh, uh, nanophotonics and, and using uh, so-called phonon polaritons to uh, compress the light down to small dimensions. And so, um, so I'm a chemical engineer, so uh, I'll try and explain this as best as I, I can explain it, which Slava I can explain it better. But uh, so, so the, the idea is you, you can couple infrared light to boron nitride uh, and form these quasi particles, phonon polaritons. So um, it's a coupling of, of light and, and charge. So vi lattice vibrations in, in this case, uh, a plasmon polariton would be uh, electrons in, in metals, but, but in boron nitride, the electron concentration is very low. So you couple to uh, uh, phonons instead. So, so the idea here is you have a uh, AFM tip, you introduce a, a infrared uh, laser beam onto the tip and it couples into the, the material, the boron nitride flake here, and then it creates these wave patterns uh, of uh, phonon polaritons and the pol phonon polaritons will 
uh, expand uh, like a, a stone thrown in water and reflect off the, the edges of the sample. And, and then you can scan this and, and uh, see the interference pattern. So as shown here, and, and uh, if you do um, cuts along the, the blue line here, you can, you can see the, the uh, uh, waves here or do along this red dash line, and there's another uh, waves there. But these waves, these interference waves, are much um, shorter dimensions than uh, what's possible with the free space light. So in free space light, you'd have, uh, you can't uh, image things less than roughly the wavelength of light. But here we have this compression of infrared light down to much smaller dimensions. Um, and so people are very interested in that. Another way to introduce uh, these uh, phonon polaritons is with an antenna shown here, uh, basically putting a, a metal, uh, metal cylinder or, or pattern on the surface and, and introduce um, um, radiation onto that uh, antenna and then it, it will couple with the, the boron nitride and, and make uh, phonon polaritons. So um, why, that, why this would be of interest for monoisotopic is that um, we can compare how far the, the phonons travel uh, in, in the different materials. So for natural abundance, the, the, the phonons in this specific case would be, be able to travel about five microns before they dissipate. And, and in the monoisotopic, it goes much further, uh, limited by the size of the flakes used in this study. Um, so, so the key point being that uh, these phonon polaritons can go much further in monoisotopic boron nitride than, than in the natural boron nitride. So there's, there's a lot of uh, interest in using uh, the monoisotopic for these, these uh, phonon polariton uh, studies. So uh, my collaborators have, have done uh, predictions on what the uh, lifetime should be for these uh, phonons and shown in, in this plot here. The red dots are experimental and then the, the, the open circles are, are calculated, but essentially um, can get an enhancement of uh, uh, phonon lifetime by a factor of, of roughly three. And maybe if you could get to really pure and very good quality um, uh, boron nitride, even higher, um, uh, phonon lifetimes. Uh, other, other things they investigated were uh, the reflect, uh, reflection that shifts with, uh, in infrared with uh, the, the boron, uh, isotope concentration. And again, this, this uh, hyper, uh, how the dielectric constant changes with, um, with um, frequency and, and has two regions where it goes negative. And so that's, that's of interest to um, people interested in nanophotonics. So, um, so what can you do with this? Well, one thing you could do to, with this was to introduce a, a meta surface. And this would be a, a pattern that uh, with very fine features that it allows you to uh, cause uh, diffraction or re refraction within of, of the polaritons within the material. And so uh, as an example of that, uh, uh, these individuals set up uh, a, a grating with uh, 75 nanometer wide. So they actually etched grooves into the boron nitride that were 75 nanometers wide and, and gaps with 25 nanometers. And again, they launched uh, uh, polaritons into the material shown as shown here. So again, the, the infrared light comes in on the uh, AFM tip and goes out. Uh, and then uh, this is the predicted pattern um, so very interesting. It's kind of a, um, I, I guess, a convex pattern. So you think about this, the, the normal uh, propagation, uh, if you had isotopic within the plane of the material, you'd expect these circular waves coming out uh, this way. But by patterning the, the boron nitride, uh, making this grid pattern on it, the predicted uh, wave pattern is something like this. Um, so you, you have the waves uh, uh, 
so, so the main point being that you can control how the waves propagate in the material at, at very fine dimensions, uh, smaller than the actual free space wavelength of the, of the uh, light being used. So, uh, and, and so finally in their study, they introduced a, a, a little uh, metal and introduced the polaritons um, from this metal. And again, you can see kind of the concave uh, uh, anomalous wave front um, coming up and it matches the simulation pretty close. And then as you change the frequency of, of this, you can also change the pattern from, from you know, nice uh, curves shown here to straight lines shown here. This is the simulation. This is what was actually observed. So, um, so you can definitely control how these uh, polaritons propagate through the, the boron nitride. So um, I think this has a lot of potential for, for concentrating the, the infrared light to very small dimensions and, and uh, infrared lights uh, good for detecting chemical species or biological species. And so there's a lot of interest in, in, in that. So, um, to etch such fine features into boron uh, nitride is, is very difficult and when you etch you you damage the sides of the the grid pattern so another uh, way to do this is uh, instead of um, actually um, machining the boron nitride is to put another material next to it and so um, what uh, these these harvard researchers have, have done is is actually put the boron nitride on top of uh, a phase change material. And then uh, what they can do is use a laser to pattern, um, uh, uh, change the, the space change material. So it'll change from insulating to metallic when it's been uh, heated. And so they, they pattern a, a prism, a waveguide, and, and then simulated what the expected um, pattern would be as far as the wave fronts. Uh, so at, you, as you know, uh, light going through a prism, so should should uh, refract, and so um, and so they were able to actually see that phenomena shown here, um, that they were able to create these meta lenses, um, a, a prism and a waveguide, and then uh, make kind of. I hope you can see this uh, a bunch of bars this way to, to um, make this meta lens. And we're indeed able to focus the, the polaritons within the plane of the boron nitride to uh, more or less a point. So, so I think there's a lot of potential in that. Um, I, I, I think that's one of the more exciting areas of boron nitride. But there's lots of other thing applications for, for boron nitride. And, and um, so I think uh, p potential future directions for this research, I don't see any reason why this couldn't be scaled up to make a large crystals. Like, um, uh, certainly one could do seeded growth of the boron nitride. And, and I look to the uh, process being developed in, in Japan for growing uh, silicon carbide crystals from uh, metallic solutions. So the, in their case, they use a, a, cr a liquid chromium, melted chromium. Uh, they uh, contact silicon carbide seed, dip it into the, the solution and, and withdraw it. And so they have a silicon plus chromium uh, based solution in a graphite crucible to provide the, the carbon source and, and relatively similar temperature. I think it was 1500 uh, degrees to grow this uh, silicon carbide crystal. So, I, and, and they're able to grow 50 millimeter diameter silicon carbide this way. So I, th I think something like this could be done with the hexagonal boron nitride. I think the chemistry is there such that that it's it's feasible. Um, other so so I think the efforts should be to grow larger crystals, to grow better quality crystals. I think the method can be extended by by adding impurities and doping the crystals. Um, and I also think it's possible. Certainly, you can grow uh, carbon crystals this way. Uh, graphite crystals uh, this way, and, and maybe to some of the other uh, 2D materials that are of interest. So we've been able to show that you can grow high quality uh, boron nitride by low pressure process. Uh, you can change the boron concentration to, gives you, and this gives you an additional parameter to, to change the properties of HBN. And we can uh, certainly change uh, uh, thermal conductivity and, and phonon uh, lifetime 
and, and uh, phonon lifetime makes it a good good material for nanophotonic applications. So, so this represents uh, work from a lot of uh, people, uh, my students and collaborators. And with that, um, I'd like to thank you and I'd be happy to answer questions. Much. The floor is open for questions, and also that the people online will be asked in the chat box. Yeah. So I think early on, uh, there was a slide about Kiyo's background on Chrome and there are many, many pieces. I just wonder if those pieces are, some of them are due to defect phase. Yeah. Um, I think there's a lot of controversy exactly what. Um, what the nature of those uh, peaks are, and, and people are, are still trying to figure that out. So, I mean, sorry, this one. Okay. Screen sharing is stopped. Okay. So, can I go back? Yeah, probably the easiest thing to do would just be to share your main, share the main screen. So my, my short answer is to you, I don't, I don't know that they've been completely identified. There's a lot of work in that area to try and figure out what, what, what causes them. Yeah. Was it? Uh, it showed a Raman peak around 1400 or so. Is there anything lower down? Anything? So there's one about uh, 52. So there's two peaks. Um, there's one at 1365 and then one about 52. 52. 52. Nothing in between. No. Wow. For the phonon lifetime measurements, was that determined from the Raman? Um, I believe so. And so if that's the case, how, how are you able to decouple in the cases where you have varying concentration of the isotopes response of that Raman? I, I don't know. That's that's work by my collaborator, so I'm not sure. Uh, we have a question from online. How do you peel the uh, HBN off of the sapphire? So there's no sapphire, um, but we uh, peel it off the metal using uh, uh, tape. tape. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you know if there are any nickel or chromium impurities in the core? I don't know if there's nickel or chromium in, in the boron nitride, but I suspect not because it's, it's just, uh, I, I guess I should just say I don't know. Yeah. How big are the, the crystals in one of your, your big flakes? So, um, so the individual crystals, probably uh, hundreds of, of microns, maybe, maybe 500 microns, it's to the largest. So, um, I mean, overall flakes could be much larger, but yeah. individual grains. I could we ask something from online? Sorry. Uh, Jim, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you for a nice presentation. I just had a quick question. Uh, uh, so this is DJ from Cornell. I was wondering whether the cubic phase is ruled out given the temperature you are doing the solution synthesis in, uh, or is there a window where you can uh, imagine uh, stabilizing and growing the cubic phase uh, under in the solution growth process? Um, I, I really, we've never seen any evidence of, of cubic boron nitride, and, and I'm not sure how you would, uh, I don't have any clever ideas for how to get there. And that's primarily because of the temperature, you think, right? Uh, that you showed earlier, the phase diagram. Um, and the well, energy. I, yeah, I, I uh, hmm. yeah, I'm not even sure how to answer that. So, okay. Uh, looking, looking at this phase diagram, I guess you, you, you can see predictions that cubic boron nitride should be stable below 1200 degrees Celsius. I don't know that anybody's really very successfully done that, mm. uh, except when they've used ion bombardment and then they've gotten really terrible material quality. So. Right, okay. And one more very quick question. Do you know the isotope concentration of nitrogen, uh, 14 to uh, you know the 15 ratio in your samples? Uh, we haven't actually measured it, but, uh, but 
you know, it, it's probably natural nitrogen, which is 0.4% uh, uh, N15. Okay, and you, you don't attempt to, uh, in your growths, you do not attempt to purify the isotope of nitrogen, it's primarily the boron, right? That's correct. Okay, great, thank you. I understand there's a huge difference in the temperature between these two. So this, this is 20 years difference. Oh, so it's just two. been going down over time. It's been going, okay. well, so so this is the more accurate. Yeah, I guess so. This, is, this one's more accurate, I guess. So maybe I shouldn't show the, the one on the, the left anymore. Yeah. So I believe most of the examples you showed here are thick layers of ABN. That's true. Do you see any value or interesting prospects? Um, so our collaborators have certainly um, um, uh, exfoliated it down to, to small dimensions and, and then make use of it. So it's it's like the commercial product you would buy from from whatever and then exfoliate it down. So yes, people have done that. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's been very limited studies on that, and and uh, and we we've given some samples to some people that that I think they basically I think they gave up. So, uh, but so nothing definitive, I guess. Yeah. When you use this sulfur hydroxide and potassium hydroxide process at degrees. You just edge or you from some intermediate compounds that you have to get rid of. Um, so, so it's a, a molten solution, and um, there's not really well. Okay, so after you're done done etching, there may be some particles of, of what I'm not sure on the surface that you have to wash off, um, and we will like treat it in a weak acetic acid sort of thing to get rid of any particles. So uh, did that answer your question? I'm not sure I understood it. Uh, yeah, you use uh, yeah, something weak to try and so we'll rinse it off. Most of the sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide will come off with water, but sometimes there'll be some particles of, of what I don't know. Um, and so we use a little acid to help get that off. Yeah. Uh, the effect for the isotope to the electron structure is very new to me. Mm -hmm. But by high school of chemistry tells me the isotope will not affect the electronic structure. But why here is some very important role? So, do you have any, any, any idea or brief explanation why the isotope affects the electronic structure? Um, no. So, so I, I think to first order, of course, they say that that the uh, isotope concentration doesn't matter. It's, it's a chemical effect in high school. And that's what I was brought up to believe. But when you start to really look at the details, then, then you will see some differences. So like I know that um, in, in diamond, the, the lattice constants will change with isotope concentration, whether you have diamond 12 or diamond 13, very small changes though. So, um, but um, sorry, I don't know. The, the crystal form, it forms at the surface of the, the molten metal. Right. So if, if you had like an additional component in the metal alloy that might segregate near the surface, could it affect the growth of the nucleation growth of that, that layer of crystal up there? I mean, that very small amount yeah. could potentially. Yeah, it would definitely. Right. Yeah. So we've thought about um, is there something we could, so we, we tend to have. Um, higher oxygen concentration than I'd like. So we haven't measured it very extensively, but 10 to the 19 sort of oxygen concentration. So we've thought about, can you add some, some additional component to the, the, the metal that would preferentially absorb the oxygen so the oxygen doesn't go into the boron nitride. So I think one could play with that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, did you consider using ammonia? Um, so, hmm. no, I haven't extensively thought about that. So. I just thought since you were adding hydrogen, right. yeah. maybe it would be helpful to have it. Yeah. yeah. 
coming from a non grower. So okay. is it possible to grow a film uh, with some of these strategies? Um, so I've thought about that. If, if, for example, we could put float a piece of sapphire on the surface, top surface, and then get, get uh, film to form. It, it's something we haven't really tried. Um, so, so maybe. Could I ask one more question from online? Uh, is there a thickness limit on how, how thick you can grow the HPN before, I don't know, the material stops diffusing to the metal or something like that? Um, so we've grown, we've actually produced uh, thick films as thick as 200 microns um, or crystals as thick as 200 microns. Um, and yeah, I, I think it's sort of self-limiting. You got you to worry about um, getting the nitrogen inside the solution. So I guess if it, the surface is all co covered with boron nitride, maybe that's difficult to do. Maybe not. And does it slow down gradually or does it sort of abruptly stop after 200 microns? I don't know. Okay. Right. Thank you. Since it's a webinar, I can answer Boyang's question a little bit. Okay. Um, so uh, one of the effects is the 0 0.5 rational uh, state, right? So you have a larger mass, you have a more confined vibrational wave function for, for the atom. And the lattice mass James talking about is, is basically thermal expansion, quote unquote, but the zero point contribution to that. And then once you change the last current, everything else changes, right? Although it's small, you know, everything else does change. Um, and then there's for any, at higher temperatures, the photon like tends to be all different because the photons are different. And anything that's temperature dependent by electron photon interaction will change because photon occupation is different. There may be other things, but those are the ones that pop in. Okay, if there are no further questions, let's uh, thank the speaker again. Is this your question? Yeah, it's a uh, hexagonal horn nitride. Oh, okay.